Thank you for joining together as we worship God by our gifts out of God's gifts to us. If you got your Bible with you and want to use your Bible, then grab it. If you want to use my Bible up on PowerPoint, then relax yourself. Either way is fine. Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. I want to talk to you today as we continue in our series on transition. What it means to change in a big way. I want to talk about today the second biggest transition of your life. The second biggest transition in your whole life. We have been talking about what it means to turn the page. We've been talking about what it means to follow God, to be his people. He is our God and we are his people. And what that means, not symbolically, but literally, what does he literally mean by that? We've been talking about how this was all through uh, the Old Testament, uh, God's great obsession and what he shared through uh, the prophets and what he shared by his word, this idea, what he shared in his promises, what he shared through Moses, and then many prophets to come after Moses, this idea of him wanting a special covenant relationship with us. And covenant relationship uh, is just a term that means a special and uniquely committed intimate relationship with God that is relationship like none other. It means he picked us, and it ain't just generic relationship. You kind of got relationship with everybody on earth, even the people you've never seen before. Our relationship is we are fellow citizens of the earth. So you may never see the people in China or Russia or never see the people in Indonesia, but our relationship is we are fellow citizens. You are sitting next to some people here in this church this morning. You got a relationship that's kind of like the relationship you had uh, when you went to the movies Friday night. There was a couple of people you know them real well, and there were hundreds of people there that you don't know them, don't know their name, but we are all fellow moviegoers. It's a relationship. Covenant relationship is something way beyond that. It's a relationship where out of all the possible configurations, we just citizens of the kingdom, out of all the things we could have in common, all the people God created, that's everybody who ever lived and everybody who will ever live. What do we have in common? We have a relationship kind of of brothers and sisters in creation because all of us were created by God. He says, no, I want to take it beyond that. Covenant relationship is out of everybody I created, and I created all of y'all. If you are here, I created you. Out of that, though, there is a subset of those I created as for a special, intimate, eternal relationship in spite of your insufficiencies, your flaws, your sin, in spite of the curse of sin on us that says our sin separates us from God, it says I've chosen to initiate a relationship with folks out of all the people I wanted it with everybody, but everybody's not going to be down. And what we've been studying about is covenant relationship means both parties are down. You will never end up in a covenant with anybody by accident. That's against the law. You never end up in a covenant by somebody because somebody did it for you that you had not authorized. No, it is both parties did it willingly and intentionally engaged in a specific and unique relationship that transcends all the other possibilities that were available. It would be available for us to have relationship with God. Who is God? He is the one who created me and put my great, 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 great grandfather and grandmother in the Garden of Eden. And so what relationship did you have? Well, I'm descendant from the first ones he created in perfection and put them in the garden. It could have just stayed like that. Could have been that kind of relationship. That ain't covenant relationship. That's just creation relationship. That's a big deal right there. But he said, nope, not going to keep it there. Could have been just a relationship where uh, the Bible says we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. So he could have said, ah, I'm a holy God in heaven. You are unholy people going to hell. What's your relationship? I'm the one not going to hell, living in heaven. You the one could have been living in heaven, going to hell. That's our relationship. He wasn't content to leave it there. 
Could have been the one where it was like the disciples of Jesus' day who stood around the cross and literally got to see Jesus die. So it could have been a relationship. Yeah, I, you know, I got a relationship. Well, what's your relationship? I happen to have been amongst those who saw him die on the cross with my own eyeballs. What difference did it make? Oh, I took some great photographs. Uh, what difference did it make? I'll never forget it. It's a heck of a story. I ain't never seen nothing like that. So I got a relationship with him as eyewitness to a big deal thing he did. Then what? You going to hell? Uh, that ain't covenant relationship. That's eyewitness relationship. He says, but there are those that I've decided I am making, opening the door, made it possible by the death of my son and the promise that I extended. I want to extend a unique and eternal relationship where your sin does not count against you, where the original idea that I had in mind, I am your God, you are my people, that in spite of your sin, in spite of the messed up world, in spite of the uh, tornado in more uh, Oklahoma, in spite of the tsunami in Sri Lanka, in spite of the financial meltdown, in spite of how busy the devil is, I picked you for intimate, eternal relationship where you will be joined with me in eternity in spite of yourself. And that ain't everybody because everybody ain't down. God's down. Everybody ain't down. So that's what we mean by covenant relationship. And we talked about the fact that that is his great desire, his desire for relationship with us. Bigger than just rules and regulations and the keeping of vows, it's relationship. So last time we studied, we talked about the fact that it was a people who were created by God making a big change. It was transitioning into people who are saved or redeemed or forgiven in covenant relationship with God. That's a big transition right there. What did you have to do for that transi transition? Oh, you had to pray and fast all night. No, you didn't. What did you have to do for that change to happen in your life? Uh, pull yourself together. Stop all that sinning. Get holy like Jesus. No, you didn't. What did you have to do? You had to think about it real, real hard and be born in a Christian home. And if you got a praying grandmother, then her going to heaven translates into you going to heaven because you know her. Not true. And what does it take to have covenant relation? That first big change is being changed. The Bible talks about in the New Testament being brought out of darkness and into the marvelous light. And what did you have to do? Somebody had to die. Was it you? Uh, actually, no. Somebody's uh, uh, blood had to be sacrificed for that to happen. Uh, was it you? Uh, actually, no. It was not me. I got all my blood. It's still in me. It has not been sacrificed, and I got this covenant. Somebody had to be perfectly righteous. Absolutely. Was it you? No. I was messed up before the transition happened. I still, quiet as it's kept, messed up now, and every now and then, my mess ups ain't even so quiet. Y'all seen a couple of them, so I got relationship, even though in and of myself, I am not cleaned up. What you had to do, you had to get somewhere and suffer and punish yourself so that you would be worthy of covenant relationship. Well, actually, no. Uh, he started talking about joy and peace and abundant life. He never got to the part where I got to suffer to pay for it. Somebody did. His name is Jesus. And covenant relationship is me simply in my heart of faith saying yes to his heart of grace and saying yes to what Jesus said. What did he say? He said, apart from me, you can't hook up our relationship. You can have it through me then I'm saying the same thing as you, Jesus. Your righteousness is as filthy rags, but my righteousness is unpolluted. And it is through my righteousness that you can be in covenant relation. If that's what you're saying, I believe you. I ain't never seen you, but I'm down with that. I believe you. If you are saying, love me enough to obey me, not to get relationship with me, but because you got relationship with me, I'm down with that, God. It is us saying amen to what he's already said and done, that was the part you played in that transition. We like to try to slap ourselves on the back and act like we played a bigger role in this. You received something, just like a Christmas present from somebody that loves you. What did you have to do? Loan them your credit card? Nope. What did you have to do? Drive them to the store? Nope. What did you have to do? Receive it 
when they offered it. He did the giving. We do the receiving. If he did the giving, and with that first transition from lost to saved, from a people created by God to a people in covenant with God, if he does the giving and we don't do the receiving, guess what? We ain't in that covenant relationship with God expounded upon in the Old Testament. Then we've come over to the New Testament. And we found out that the language is very similar. It makes sense because Jesus says, I didn't come to destroy the Old Testament. I didn't come to do away with what was the centerpiece of the Old Testament, faith-filled, worshipful observance of the law. He said, I didn't come to do away with that. I came to fulfill it. I came to upgrade it beyond where it is. Jesus did it perfectly and said, since your way ain't perfect, as a matter of fact, your way is pretty trifling. When you try your best, it's pretty trifling. I will let my way count for your way. And instead of you being uh, far away from me, me being far away from you, but my grace being so sufficient for you that I give you a way to sacrifice pigeons and lambs and goats and doves, I'm going to now change. We're going to transition to a new way. New Testament is still the same where I've given you a gracious way. The new one is is one lamb. That one lamb is coming and his name is Jesus. You're going to do this sacrifice one time. You ain't got to come back to the temple to kill it again. You ain't got to find out how I'm going to get a goat to pay for what I did wrong. It is now receiving by faith what he has given out of his radical grace. And that's how we have an eternal relationship where we have favor with God, access to God with us. So much so that there will come a time when we will be physically with God. We'll see him as he is. He's coming to get us. And it says when he comes, we'll find out we'll be just like him. And we're going to rule and reign with him. So that's who you are. When we come over to the New Testament, the same kind of force and the same kind of obsession, the same kind of repetition with which God spoke all through the prophets in the Old Testament and all through the laws of the Old Testament, the writings of the Old Testament, the voice of God speaking to his people, saying, I will be your God and you will be my people. He keeps that same theme up, but he uses a different kind of language. And in the New Testament, it's a language of, I will be your God. Come follow me. Follow me. Why? Because he ain't far away anymore. He's God with us. So he was there preaching it for himself. It's not a prophet. He's sending. He is the prophet, Jesus himself. And he says, come, follow me, follow me. And then he starts using word, if anyone will come after me, if anyone will be my covenant people by following, anyone will be my covenant people by coming after me, anyone will be my covenant people by being my disciples. If you follow through the New Testament, the way Jesus speaks about discipleship or coming after him dozens of times in the gospels alone, using that term disciple or discipleship or follow me or come after me seems to be used in the same context synonymously. It means a unique relationship with God that's beyond just he created you and beyond just I'm a member of the church. It is relationship where we are following him. And that word follow there is not just a symbolic term that means, you know, symbolically I think about him and symbolically I go to church. That's what he means by follow. No, it says in Luke chapter 9 verse 23, if anyone will come after me or if anyone will follow me let him deny himself take up his cross follow me when we look back at that word in the original language that it was written translated come after me or follow me depending on your english translation of the bible in luke chapter 9 verse 23 we find out it's a word that means something way more than just uh, uh i'm following you anthony get in front of me would you stand up here in front of me i want you to slowly walk toward uh that second aisle right there right and i'm following anthony that ain't what's used in the New Testament. Follow. It's, it's not that. Thank you, brother. Excellent. Excellent. It's, it's not just following as in he going east, I'm going east. He walking with the right foot, I'm walking with the right foot. No, it's much more picturesque word. That word existed in the original language of the New Testament. That ain't the word that was picked. The word that he picked is a word that has as its base the meaning of imitation. It has to do with the idea when he says, come after me or follow me or discipleship. All of it is kind of synonymous in its meaning, and it has to do with the idea of becoming like you. It means intentionally, I am in such intimate relationship with you. I am on purpose, not accidental, not coincidental. I am on purpose trying to be like you. 
that makes perfect sense because the first thing we know about God saying anything about creating any of us, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit said, let us make man in our image. Many commentators believe it means let us make man as our image. What does that mean? We are imitators of God, the very purpose for which he first pronounced a desire to create us. It ain't some new idea. We're in covenant relationship with a God who says, I want you. The vision ain't changed. It ain't changed from uh, Adam and Eve. It ain't changed from the, uh, Moses. It ain't changed from the prophets. It ain't changed when the Old Testament went out and the New Testament came in. It ain't changed from Jerusalem to Los Angeles. And the vision is the same. What is it? That we would be in intimate covenant relationship with him where it is relationship where we are his disciples, his imitators. Anything other than that may be good. And it may be that it's not sinful, but it ain't the purpose for which you were created. It is something other than what God's obsessed about. What about making some money and paying these bills and keeping the man off my back and staying out of trouble so I don't go to jail? And what about taking care of my mama and my grandmama and my drunk daddy? What about those are wonderful things to do? Well, that's my purpose in life. What about becoming a great doctor or a lawyer or a praise team leader or a preacher or media ministry worker? That's my purpose. It's, nope. Got obsession in the Old Testament and it's the same in the New Testament. First transition is that you go from headed to hell to headed to heaven, that you go from just being created by me to being in covenant with me. That was the first one and that was an easy transition to make because when we heard it, it sounded too good to be true, right? Sounded like a timeshare sale. It was something that did just sound too good to be true. You're saying it cost me that little. I just got to believe it, receive it, and follow you. And all the hard part, the painful part of making it possible, you already did it, and it counts for me. The first transition was easy. So I'm going, okay, if in this covenant relationship, it's some more transitions to be made. I expect the rest of them going to be just as easy as the first one. So hook me up, Lord. Show me how it goes. Uh, what you got for me now? Look what it says in uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus answered the question, what is this? This is the second biggest transition. This is from being somebody who has accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior, which costs you nothing. Easy transition from lost to found. From headed to hell to headed to heaven. Second transition is to being his disciple. A little different. Look what it says. Luke chapter 9 verse 23. I'm reading in the Message Bible. Then Jesus told them what they could expect for themselves. That is what they could expect for themselves being disciples. Anyone who intends to come with me. That's that word. Anyone intending to follow me. Anyone intending to come after me. Anyone intending to be my disciple. Your translation may even use one of those other terms. Has to do what? Let me lead. You are not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Wait a minute, I thought you did the suffering. Yeah, that was so you could be in covenant relationship with me. That was that first transition in this relationship. It was pretty easy. You could do it just like that. You could do it at home. You don't even have to go to church for it. You didn't have to clean anything up. Boom, easy. This new one is, it is surrendering control of your life and me being in the driver's seat and you not running from suffering, embracing it. Follow me. There's that term again in the Message Bible. Follow me and I will show you how. Do you hear that? Follow me. You got to do the accepting of suffering. You got to do the uh, uh, embracing of uh, suffering and the embracing of following me, imitating me, becoming like me. But he says, here's how it will happen. By your determination. No, your determination is part of it, but it takes more than your determination to make this happen. What does he say? I will show you how. Say, I'm God with you now. I can show you all kinds of stuff. I ain't up in heaven and you down on earth. I'm God down here on earth with you. I am God, fully man, wrapped up in humanity, and yet fully God. Follow me and I'll show you. We talked about Peter being uh, called and all those disciples called to follow him, f called to be his disciples. Then we get to what it says, I will show you how in Luke 9, 23 through 27. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to finding yourself, your true self. What good would it be for you to get everything you want and to lose the real you? 
What I'm talking about today is the second biggest transition of your life, and that is the decision not to be a ch just a covenant, in covenant relationship with God, not just to be a uh, faithful, active member of the New Dawn Christian Fellowship. It is not just to be a part of the body of Christ universal. It's not just to be in the crowd of people that's headed to heaven when Jesus comes back. It is to be his disciple. Look what it says in Mark 3. Mark 3, verse 14. It reads like this, contemporary translation. His plan, that is Jesus' plan, was that his disciples would be spending time with him, and then he would send them out to declare his gospel to others. That was his plan. How do we live, if you think about it, that, that it says in the Bible that Jesus' plan, his plan all along, it, it didn't just start when Jesus came. It didn't just start when the prophets came on the scene. It didn't just start in the New Testament. It didn't just start when the Old Testament came. It was his plan all along. He said, let us make man in our image. We will be uh, God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit. We will be their God. They will be our people in a unique, committed, imitating way. It says his plan all along was what, Martin? Uh, 3, verse 14, his plan all along was that his disciples would be spending time with him, and then he would send them out to declare the gospel. Don't be afraid of that word disciple. That word disciple there used in the New Testament is a word at its very root that uh, means along the lines of learner or student. Learner, student, deep. No deeper than that. Learner, student, imitator, follower. I'm a disciple of bloody blind such and such. I've heard uh, musicians, Wynton Marsalis uh, on NPR the other day in an interview was talking about he is a disciple of Miles Davis, a disciple of such and such. It doesn't mean they worship him. It means they follow him. They're influenced by them, inspired by them, empowered by them, that they want what's on the one who is their discipler to rub off on the disciple. In my uh, schooling, uh, there comes a point in training to be a psychologist that you have to choose your orientation. And what it means by that is you're going to be the kind like Freud. If you're a disciple of Freud, it means they lay on the couch uh, for several years, maybe the rest of their lives. That would have been a great hustle. I should have picked that orientation. They lay on your couch for years and they just talk. And the therapist's job is, if you're a disciple of Freud, to say the least amount possible. So you say, mm-hmm, and you say, uh-huh, and you ask them questions mainly about their childhood, which means it opens up things where they're supposed to make the connection that the reason that you're such a rotten spouse now is because of such and such that happened on the potty seat when you were being toilet trained as a child. And as a disciple of Freud, I ain't disrespecting Freud. I imagine people have gotten blessed by that. You could pick that, and that means you'd be a kind of therapist who don't say a lot because you'd be imitating Freud. If you're a disciple of uh, uh, Rogers, Rogers, whose orientation I follow, wrote a whole lot, did a lot of research, and was a psychologist who believed in what's called cognitive behavioral uh, orientation, which means basically, it's like he stole it from Scripture, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It means whatever you believe is real down on the inside, you're going to act like that's true. That means if you believe everybody's against you, and if you believe that everybody's trying to hurt your feelings, you're going to act like it. You're going to have a funky face on. Sometimes you're going to stay away from us, or you're going to be around us and get real stank with us real fast because you already believe something. So whether it's true or not, it's true for you. So that means anything that is not in keeping with the Word of God, a uh, behavioral therapist is trying to get your behavior to match the truth of the Word of God, which means we're working with people people so that they believe the truth of the Word of God. See, very different orientation. It means the, those who are disciples of Rogers do a whole bunch of talking. Jesus said, if you are my disciples, here's what it looks like. If you're my disciples, it's a particular orientation. It means you follow me. If you are my disciples, there's a whole bunch of good stuff you could be doing with your life. If discipleship meant being a good member of the church, then it means that you show up here, drop an offering in, try to make it a big offering. If you're here, that you don't cuss nobody out, at least not on the premises of the church. It means that you know the words to the songs and this and that. It means that you show up at the same church. And that's why some people never leave their church all their lives. They are criticizing. I ain't learning here. I ain't being fed here. I can't stand it here. But in their mind, what they believe is, if I was born here, I was supposed to stay here. And that's what discipleship means. So they don't go. And they stay babies. Why? Because they hate God. Uh-uh. 
because they got the wrong idea about what discipleship is. What other ideas could it be? Discipleship means finding out all the promises in that word and finding out how God going to hook me up with them. Wait a minute, now it says he going to do what? <laughs> Supply all my needs? That's what it is to be a disciple? If that's pretty much the basis of what it means to be his disciple, then what do we do? We'll listen to TV and radio programs or read books or hear prophecies and write them down uh, or, or get blessed clause and all that, but only the prophecies that say something about you finna go to the next level, next level. I, I hear next level. I see it. I see it. Can God and does God advance our lives and take us to next levels of faith? Yes, grace to grace and faith to faith that he moves us in maturity. But if the whole bottom line of it is to be his disciple means he is dispensing blessings and I'm receiving those blessings, it means that from the time I wake up to the time I go to bed, my life is obsessed with what's the next blessing. It means how God going to get me out of this one. Ooh, this don't bless me. This, this, I lost my boyfriend, lost my girlfriend. This don't bless me. So discipleship means he's going to take me out of this pain right away, quick, fast, in a hurry. I, I uh, don't have enough money to buy the house. I got about $37.22 uh, in my savings account. But uh, discipleship means that he supplies what I ask him for. Then that means I'm going to do like a lot of people did prior to 2008. Just buy food. Faith, just go get a loan. They're going to ask you, are you breathing? I'm going to say, yes, in Jesus' name, I am breathing. They say, you got 12 cents? I'll say, yes. They say, put a 12 cent down payment down. We're going to give you the keys to the house. Then we will shout and dance. Why? Because discipleship meant he blessed us. That means if we lost the blessing that we got in 2006, if we lost it in 2011, then it means the devil is busy. And what the devil stole from me, God's going to get it back. What we mean is them keys got out of my hands, but those keys are coming back back up in my hands and then your hand is open and the keys ain't there and it's because what we've defined discipleship by some sweet sounding legitimately unsinful ways but they ain't the ways that our disciple has defined discipleship that means if you are going to be in the second biggest transition of your life going to heaven was the biggest transition you're headed to hell now you're going to heaven you are saved and in relationship with him instead of an enemy hospital to him. That was big. The biggest. Didn't cost us anything. This second one, is, second one is big, and it cost a lot. It is following him per his definition of discipleship, and it changes everything about who you are as a man. It changes everything about who you are as a woman. It changes everything about who you are as a member of this church, a leader, a minister, a servant uh, in the body of Christ. It changes everything about your career. It doesn't mean necessarily that we get rid of those things. It means that the highest priority, his plan, all the time, his vision that never changed is that we transition from people who are living as if the secondary things are the highest priority into living as people who are following him like that's the highest priority. That means I better understand as much as I can about how he's moving and where he's moving and what his style is, otherwise I can't imitate him well. That means because he's not down here for me to physically see him, how do we see him? The word, the word itself is what shows us who God is and how God is. And imitating him means following his definition and design for discipleship. You with me? Then let's look at it. That's what we're going to be looking at. What is, what is that? What is that? I've got a few minutes left. I'm going to share this with you. Look what it says in Luke chapter 8, verses Four through eight. Luke chapter eight, verses four through eight. Contemporary translation is on the screen. It reads like this. Jesus told this story to a large crowd. A farmer went out to plant some seed, and he scattered it across the field, and some of the seed fell on the walkway, and it got trampled over. Other seed fell on the shallow, rocky soil, and it never developed deep roots. Yet other seed fell into thorny, weed-filled soil, and it got choked out. But there was also other seed that fell on what? Fertile soil or good soil, and it grew abundantly. Look at what it says in verse 14. Jesus explains to his disciples, the thorny ground represents those who hear and accept my message. 
They follow me. But eventually it gets choked out by what? Their concerns about life, making a good living, and pursuing pleasure. Notice none of those three things are bad in and of themselves. It's not bad. There was a, a, a lady in our neighborhood when our kids were little. It, we lived in a neighborhood where everybody looked out for everybody else's kids, right? And one of our neighbors, Sharon, loved to watch the soap operas in the afternoon. So all of us had little kids at the time, and we'd watch out in the street. We lived in the hood, so we got to watch each other's kids. We got to make sure everybody's all right. We were interdependent. We were a village, right? Takes a village to raise every one of, them ba one of those blessings that the Lord <laughs> had given us, our children. So Sharon, everybody knew, don't mess with Sharon in the afternoon when the soaps are on from 12 to 3. Don't mess with her. She got general hospital ministry. She had young and the restless ministry. She had one life to live and all that kind of stuff. So that meant we need to watch extra carefully for Sharon because Sharon was otherwise engaged during the 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock hour. Well, one time Sharon got so deep, presumably got so deep into the soap opera that uh, we looked out the window and my wife spotted Sharon's little, I don't know, may have been, maybe a, a year old at that point, and uh, 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 her son came, came out the house with his diapers on and everything and was out doing a little dance on the front yard, chilling before the Lord, worshiping like David, just dancing in his diapers and this and that. After a while, he got, as we were crossing the street trying to deal with him, we saw he got bored by dancing, saw us coming. He tried coming out the gate. Let me just open up this gate, try to get off in there right now. Was anything wrong with Sharon watching the soap operas? No, wasn't nothing sent. Well, I don't know what's on the soap operas, but no, in and of itself, she's watching television. The Lord blessed us with the TV and this and that. However, did it work out for soap opera watching to become her highest priority and baby watching to become even her second one? Even when something not sinful gets in first place and what deserves to be in first place goes into second place, it shifts the whole balance of things and all kind of destructive stuff can happen even though what deserves to be in second place ain't sinful. Look what he says. The thorny ground represents those who hear and accept my message but eventually gets choked out by what? Adultery. No, what is it? Eventually it gets choked out by demonic activity. No, not necessarily even that. Eventually it gets choked out by just them becoming agnostic atheist rebels. No, doesn't even say that. It said the seed gets planted on thorny ground and it gets choked out by concerns about life. You better be concerned about your life. Not worried about your life, but yeah, you better be thinking about what's happening in your life. We ain't think we love you, but we ain't thinking about your life. We we really not. If you, if you need something to holler, we might start thinking about your life. If you ain't thinking about your life, we ain't thinking about your life. We was thinking about our lives. He says, concern for your life. And life's got a lot of concerns in it, doesn't it? Concern for our loved ones and concerns for our receding hairlines and concerning for our 401ks and concern about our high blood pressure and concern about our low self-esteem and concern about a vacation and all kinds of things that are part of the abundant life. But Jesus said, be careful, my disciples. You can receive my message. You can come after me for a time. But if you are not careful, secondary things can choke out the primary thing, which is you following me to be like me. And it can be concerns about life. It can be making a good living, he said. Your Bible may say wealth. Making a good living. Shouldn't you be concerned about that? Shouldn't we be trying to make more money? Shouldn't we be trying to pay our bills? Shouldn't we be trying to be blessed with more square footage if more square footage is available? Not if it is a focused attention on it that distracts us from what is the primary purpose and design of your life. Jesus said, you are my disciple and everything else is stuff you do if you got some time left over. I got to get this degree. No, you want to get this degree. And God may have hooked it up where you will get this degree. But I guarantee you something. You can follow Jesus as his disciples with success in getting the degree. And you can follow Jesus as his disciple failing at getting the degree. 
You can follow Jesus as his disciples if you get a mate because you're lonely and you just don't like being out here by yourself. God just made you that way. You may be right. And life don't feel right. You would be better if you had a mate to help you, to encourage you, and you'd encourage them. I can assure you, if God sends you a mate, and you better go on some dates to try to get some, if that's what you want, try to get some dates, you can be his disciples dating and getting a mate. And I guarantee you, you can be his disciple not dating and not getting a mate and lonely. This thing that is our primary can be snuffed out if we let it become our secondary. And he says it is, it can happen easily by even legitimate stuff like what? Concerns about life, making a living, and pleasure. You see that word pleasure there? It is not pleasure in the sense of sinful pleasure necessarily. It can include all of that. But it's pleasure in the sense of the pursuit of something that makes us feel good. Is there anything wrong with feeling good? No. Is it great when people say, you know, I was feeling so down in the dump and I came to church and some kind of way the Lord spoke his word to me and I just went away feeling better. This is not bad. This is good. What he's showing us by his word is the very purpose for which we live. The enemy does not distract us from it necessarily by getting us to do what's the opposite of discipleship. It is getting us to do some secondary good stuff instead of discipleship. It means if discipleship is knowing you and following you and living as if I am Jesus on planet earth while he's gone. I want to talk like Jesus. I want an agenda like Jesus. I want to have a relationship with money like Jesus did. I want to have a relationship with people like Jesus did. I want to have a relationship with privacy like Jesus did. What kind of relationship did Jesus have with privacy? He had no privacy. He was always with people. Not true. There's several times it says in the New Testament, in the Gospels, that he had pulled away before day by himself. When they came and found him, he didn't go, I'm so sorry. I momentarily lapsed in my discipleship of God the Father. He didn't apologize at all. You find out the next time he said, y'all cross the water, get on over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. I'll meet you over there. And it says, after they went away to cross the ocean, he went away by himself in privacy to talk to the Father. Did he? Because privacy is good. When the people came and said they brought their sick and their wounded and they brought their loss to him, then he go, I need some me time. Y'all just better get out my face. Discipleship means I am tired, disgusted. Y'all should have been saved. Lay hands on yourself. Don't be coming up in my face. I was healing people last week. Why didn't y'all come last week? Now, last week you was too tired. Last week you was talking about me. This week you're coming to get something from me. Nope. He just interrupted his privacy. It's the, it's following him is having relationship with good stuff, not just bad stuff, good stuff. That's the kind of relationship that he had. Why? Because discipleship means that I am with him so that I can learn him, so that I can imitate him, so that even in his absence, I live as his image on planet earth. And anything, get this y'all, anything, even good things that get in the way of that, have to be rearranged or tossed out. Now, here's where the cold part comes. Because there are people who would want to stand with a microphone or not with a microphone and tell you what good things you need to get rid of. And the good things you might need to downgrade or delete can be different from the things I need to downgrade or delete. When I first got saved, I didn't know any better. And somebody came to me, and I love, I'm a movie freak. Just love movies. Love, love to see them, think about them, love to read about the actors in them. I don't know about sports. I was a little fat kid uh, all through uh, my childhood years, so nobody wanted me to play sports with them. So I got into movies. I, could, I know movie stats like you know sports stats. And so when I got saved, somebody came alongside me, and I thought, okay, I just need to learn more of this word so I can find out what I'm supposed to do and not do to be a good disciple. Somebody, well-intentioned, one of the disciples came alongside, you do know you're going to have to cut out all that card playing and all that movie going and dancing. Well, I was, at that point, when I first got saved, a professional dancer. I earned my living dancing. They told me, oh, excuse me, by the way, you got to stop dancing. I said, well, really? I knew there was supposed to be some suffering in there. But I'm supposed to give up my gig? You don't see in the Bible where Jesus danced. 
You know what I'm saying? The Bible, where Jesus went to the movies, you know what I'm saying? The Bible, no scripture where it says Jesus sat down and played cards. Therefore, you got to give those things up. Well, I was new at it. I was brought up in a good Christian home. My daddy was a pastor, but I never had a personal relationship. I was a member of the church. I never considered myself a disciple until way later when I was a dancer and got saved and was looking to be discipled and follow Jesus in personal, imitating relationship. So at first I was going, okay, well, they've been at it longer than me. I guess it's probably, they said it's worldly and I can't do that. So I guess I need to let that go because I ain't playing. I do want to follow Jesus. Then some kind of way, the one who told me, don't you dance and don't you play cards and don't you go to the movies, they gave me that word from God. We walk into the church parking lot together. I'm trying to assimilate this, digest it, figure out a new career for myself and everything. And then as we got to their car, they said, look how the Lord has blessed me with this new Cadillac. And it was a fancy Cadillac. They slid up in the car. That's how God will bless you if you follow him. And when they drove away, I got to thinking, wait a minute. I don't see no Cadillacs up in here either. So I'm thinking maybe there's a such thing as these not being good things or bad things, but some of these things are things that if they are in the wrong spot, that's how they get us. They choke out the word. They inhibit our discipleship. So let me ask you this. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ in this life, not back in Jerusalem, now, what are some of the challenges of good stuff that could be like thorny weeds that in first base priority could choke out discipleship? What could they be? What could they be for you? What could they be? That one I said earlier, for me, privacy. Privacy. I, I, have, a, uh, I have a mind that shifts all the time, and I got a body that moves all the time. So my battery gets charged by being by myself in solitude. So I got to make sure I get enough solitude. It's good stewardship of this body. But anything that is a good God-given thing can be turned into an idolatrous thing. So that sometimes solitude starts getting good to me. It gets so good to me, I don't want to answer the phone. I don't want to uh, check the email. I don't want to pray for you. Not when I got Miles Davis playing on the thing. There's food in the refrigerator. The house is clean. The couch is comfortable. And I ain't sin it. It can feel this good. And it ain't sin. I'll give you what's left. But what I'm learning is discipleship is letting myself be interrupted. Why? Because the one I'm imitating got interrupted. And he let it happen. So what do you see? What do you see? What could it be for you? Yes. Exercising. Is exercising a good thing? You better believe it is. As a matter of fact, it's a good thing that we need to preach more about in the body of Christ. We got disciples who ain't living very long because they ain't exercising disciples. So there it is. She said, that's a good thing. That's good stewardship of your body. It's going to last much longer. It's profitable, right? Great. Can it get bumped up to first place? In what way could exercise, or what way does exercise sometimes get bumped up to first place and actually choke true discipleship for you? Ah, oh, there you go, there you go. We rebuke you. No, we don't, no, we don't, we don't, we don't rebuke. Just like that. My first priority is I said I was going to do 500 crunches. They'll get along fine at the church till I get there, till I get to these 500 crunches. So what do we do? I'll have a flabby belly because I only did 200 crunches. But I'm going to be a disciple with a little paunch because following him means the decision is not made between good or bad. It is made between first place and second place. Anybody else? What you got? What's yours? Yes, ma'am. Work it. Work, you better work. There's a place in the Bible that says if, if they ain't working, don't let them eat. Let's pass around the petition. I'll sign it first. Yes. If you ain't, work, ain't willing to work, don't be eating our groceries if you ain't willing to work. She said, I got kids. I got bills. You better work. Thank God. He gives us those jobs. He gives us the power to get well. So how can something that comes from God get in the way of what comes from God, the purpose for my life? How can work get in the way sometimes of discipleship?
Oh, God. She said, sometimes I wake up, she says, I'm a funeral director. Sometimes I know when it's time to go over there and cut something, embalm something, casketize something. I'm going to be there. If it's a 9 o'clock appointment with uh, Grandma Josephine, I'm going to be there, and I'm going to be ready to transition Grandma Josephine from this state she's in to her beautiful funeral state. So I'm going to make sure that I'm up in time for my relationship with dead Grandma Josephine. And if I get up and there is some time to communicate with my highest priority relationship, I'm going to do it. If not, I can get back to it another time. Is sleeping in sinful? No. Is prioritizing it or work sinful higher than following after him and the decisions that Jesus would make? Yes. What works against discipleship? Whatever works against us thinking, acting, speaking, doing as Jesus would do. I feel like if you cuss me out, I ought to cuss you out. And I cuss better than you. So I not only feel as if I should cuss you out because you earned it, I don't cuss you out first. But if you do it first, I'll go there with you. I will win too because I'm more than a conqueror. <laughs> and so if discipleship means God's on my side so I got to win everything, then I can let the promise of God be distorted into the permission to sin. What's yours? What's yours? Got room for one or two others. Stanley. Following the NBA finals. I love you, Lord. And you know, soon as, the, soon as this is all over with, soon as they've given the trophy or the ring or whatever it is they give at the NBA final, I'm going to be back with you so much, Lord. I got some things to share with you. We're going to have a good old time. We're going to pray. Uh, the pressure's off. I got several pages of pressure's off. I'm going to catch. Soon as everything settles down, Lord, because I tell you, I got to get through these playoffs. I need this. I work so hard and this and that. Is anything wrong with Stanley watching the playoffs? Absolutely not. Can good stuff like that, pleasure, what does it do? Gives him pleasure. Is it sinful pleasure? No, it's not sinful pleasure. Did it hurt somebody? No, it didn't hurt somebody. Does it, does, does it, uh, uh, is it infidelity to Alice? No, she's sitting up there watching the game too. It's not infidelity. They're holding hands and eating popcorn. It's fellowshipping together. What's the problem? Is that when any secondary Jesus ordained, endorsed, and signed off upon thing has access to my life to become a priority that's higher than doing what Jesus would do, thinking like Jesus would think, giving like Jesus would give, being tender like Jesus would be tender, being tough like Jesus would be tough, being single and happy about it like Jesus was, being single and sad about it and still following Jesus, being married and happy or sad about it. Why? Here's the second biggest transition of our lives. It is to transition from a good life of jobs and family happiness and healing in our bodies and high self-esteem and uh, cancer-free diagnoses and good service on Sunday and getting the perfect new pastor and a new budget and even evangelizing this community. No, it is none of those. We'll close with this. Look what it says in Luke. I'm sorry, in John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Look what it says in verse 26. Jesus had been out preaching and teaching and doing miracles by this point. He'd even done the miracle of the fishes and loaves and fed the people. That went over really big. If discipleship means I follow you, you preach a little bit, and you uh, feed me at no cost to me, that's, I'm, I, I want to be your disciple all day long. But after he did that, it says Jesus shifted and started teaching them more about what following me, what discipleship is, what coming after me is. Look what he says. Jesus answered them, verse 26 of John 6. Jesus answered them and said, most assuredly I say to you, 
you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Verse 27, do not labor for the food which perishes. And that word labor there doesn't just mean don't go to work for it. Yeah, go to work to pay your bills and buy your groceries. That word labor there means to toil as if it is the number one priority of your life. Don't toil as if it is the number one priority of your life in order to get stuff that perishes anyway. But toil as if it's the number one priority of your life for that which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. Verse 28, then they said to him, okay, okay, but what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Maybe that's the question at the end of this sermon today. Maybe that's the question that floats through your head. Okay, Lord, I want to be your disciple. Okay, Lord, I want to put first things first and leave second things where they belong. Therefore, Lord, if you just tell me, I got my pad and pen out, I got my tablet, I got my smartphone ready, just tell me the things I'm supposed to do. I am never satisfied, Lord, till you tell me. I appreciate the theory and the philosophy, but run it down to me. What's the duties description up in here? And that's what they said. Okay, you sold us. Now what we supposed to do to do what you do? Look what Jesus says. Verse 26, Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. That you believe in him. See that word believe there? It's a word that means to know something to be so true that we live life according to it. I believe. It comes from, our English word believe comes from the old English by your living, by liveth. It doesn't just mean I know something in my head. It means what I know and believe in my head and my heart is manifest in my lifestyle. Jesus said, you want to be my disciple? Here's what it looks like for you to believe what I've said and to live your life according to it. What have I said? That I want you to come after me and be my disciple in the day-to-day -day affairs of your life. How? What? What's involved in it? That's what we will be studying as we go forward. Is it something that will happen to me, or is it something I do? Once I've decided I'm going to be his disciple, I'm going to transition from this life that I've lived. I'm going to transition from kind of being a good Christian to being a true disciple. I'm going to transition from kind of just being a church member to being a true disciple. I'm going to transition from just being a blessings recipient to being a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm going to transition to my def from my definition of it to his definition of it. How does it work? Meet me here this coming Tuesday night. Because I want to continue, not only in talking about the pressures off, but I want to continue from this. How to pray and communicate with God like a disciple. How to communicate with God like a true, Jesus-defined disciple. Communication being a two-way street. Why? Because we're studying about not just how to think it, but how to actually make the second biggest transition of your life.